Good morning. Josh needs to hear it in Holland. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. When we get to sing the, the songs this morning, we need to take the roof off um, as we celebrate the life of Paul. I've only known Paul for two and a half years, and I would bet that the majority of people here have known Paul for much longer than that. But in that time, he's become a friend, my rector's warden, a confidant, fantastic member of the team here at Nambaka Valley, and I'm going to miss my rector and warden's meetings on a Monday morning once a month in Elk. And who's going to fill in the grant applications now? <laughs> I don't think they need to fill too many of those in in heaven. I'm going to start with a couple of sentences of scripture, then we'll do the welcome and then we'll stand and sing our first song, which is There is a Redeemer. But in the Gospel of John, we hear, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet will they live. And our reading today is from Romans 12, but here's a couple of verses from Romans 8, which are equally as good. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will, able, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So welcome to this service of celebration, which is always going to be tinged with sadness, but let's make it a celebration because we've all benefited from our relationship with Paul. So grace and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. If you're able, would you like to stand and we'll sing as hard as we can. There is a Redeemer. I love that picture of Paul on the front of the order of service. And that, just remember that picture when we get to the last verse of the reading from Romans. And also that picture on the inside of the order of service, the one on page two on the left, the one where Paul is little. He's either very keen on prayer or he's, yes? I'm, I'm not sure I know all the words.
you like to sit down for our reading this morning? Our reading for this morning is from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 13. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Probably very appropriate that uh, things don't go exactly right because Paul, Paul spent a lot of time in Africa and there's a saying that is Africa, this is Africa. So, anyway, we're here now and we're in Australia and we'll see if we can make it all right from here on in. So, we would all agree today that when I get my glasses, I can see what I've written. This is Australia. We would all agree that Paul was an all-around great guy who was taken home far too soon. I think we'd all agree on that one. Paul was a wonderful husband, father, grandfather, neighbour, community, community person, friend, farmer. He was a DJ, activist, archivist, activist too if you like, <laughs> storyteller, handyman and anything else that is positive. And today... Our sympathy and prayers are for you, Anne, and for um, Tim and Natalie, Catherine, Carolyn and Ben, and grandchildren Isaac, Anastasia, Nathan, Joshua, Jack, Harry and Max, and uh, Gus too. <laughs> Today we would ask that God would pour out his comfort and peace on this sad and sudden loss of Paul. We really miss somebody special today. And Anne asked me to speak today because she thought I was one of Paul's friends who had known Paul the longest. Well, yes, one of Paul's friends, but last night I found out there's somebody here who played trains with Paul <laughs> on the lounge room floor back in Pennant Hills, if you're going to put your hand up. <laughs> when I first heard about Paul, it was 1971 when I went to study at SNBC for two years and at weekends would stay at Pennant Hills with family friends. <laughs> Paul lived in the same street and also my wife-to-be, Rosie, lived in Pennant Hills and all attended the same church. And Paul was a city slicker who went jackarooing on Bundamar Station and I knew more about Bundamar than I did about the Sydney, so we had a connection there straight away. From then on, Paul was often at our place on our farm and his Hawkesbury Ag College Pract experiences and other things. And we have many, many happy memories of that time and since as well. First there was Paul, he came for a visit to do some prac work and then there was Paul with Anne and on the visit with Anne when she came they, we planted an entire tree lot after which Rosie declared that Anne would make a suitable wife for Paul. <laughs> so on the next visit it was Paul and Anne followed by Paul and Anne and Tim and then Paul and Anne and Tim and Catherine and Carolyn, everybody together at some stage or other. It was great to have ongoing fellowship and uh, in between trips to Africa, there'd always be a trip to the farm. So let's switch for a few minutes to the faith that Paul had and shared in his customary low-keyed way. There's another Paul who wrote the passage that we've just read. He started off his book speaking about the human problem of sin that all of us have sinned and fall short of God's standard. But God treats us much better than we deserve. And because of the death and resurrection of his own son, Jesus Christ, he freely accepts us and sets us free from our sin 
if we come to him humbly in repentance. Paul believed this for himself and accepted God's free gift of salvation. And what a difference was, was this going to make to Paul's life? When we came to this reading today of Romans chapter 12, spelling out what a Christian life is, changed from self-serving one to doing what God wants. And this is the chapter or the part that Ian found highlighted in Paul's Bible. Was that just recently you found that? It's been there a long time, I'd say. Since the 1980s, yes, because Paul followed this for, as a guide for his life. So this part of the Bible speaks of the character of true Christian and the hope that he has. Paul's life was lived out to please his Lord and King. And as it's written here, genuine love, holding fast to what is good, brotherly love, honouring others. This was all part of Paul's character. He was eager to serve God and contributed to his fellow man without discrimination and together with Anne were generous in hospitality. And Paul was also very self-effacing. He always put others first. Interesting. A lot of the jokes that he told were always against himself. Did you notice that? He was always part of the action, part of the scene and he didn't mind just putting himself down so that somebody else could go ahead, somebody else could be first. Looking at this verse 12 that is, was on the screen. Yep, there we go. Firstly, be joyful in hope. This is what Paul looked forward to. This is what we can all look forward to. A sure and certain hope that because Paul trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of his sins, we know where he is now. He's in heaven with his king. The only way we can have any joy in this loss is because of Jesus and his work on the cross. He's made it possible for us all to achieve that destination if we'll only believe and take that gift that he offers. Secondly, patience in affliction. Even though that we know where Paul is, we still grieve. It hurts a lot that he's gone and left us. The call is for patience that this pain in due course will ease and eventually we'll be there reunited with Paul. That's where patience comes in. Lastly, be faithful in prayer. Call out to our creator. Tell him how you feel. Tell him how much it hurts, how much you miss Paul. Beg him for comfort because now is the time to go to God in prayer and ask him for that. It's one of the gifts that he offers. It's part of his character. He wants to be, give us good gifts. And he's offered us comfort. It's not a time to avoid God. It's a time to seek him out because you can be assured that he listens and he cares. And this was Paul's worldview. It was Jesus who guided and modified his life. Paul was hardworking and a genuine, lovable country larrikin. Does that ring a bell with anybody? You only had to listen to some of Paul's stories of Africa and have his time jackarooing to say that he didn't leave fun behind just because he was a follower of Jesus. One time at our place, Rosie had some of her friends visiting, a couple of girls, and Paul thought that they were too late getting out of bed in the morning. So being a good jackaroo, his kit always contained a shotgun. So about seven in the morning, right outside their window, he let off both barrels with a boom. So we went and did some work, came back at morning tea and asked casually if they'd heard anything that morning. These two ladies looked at each other and shook their heads and Paul said, well, wasted two cartridges. <laughs> Unless they're fibbing. Paul became very good at languages. French and Fulani, and he went through some serious times in Africa with drought and difficulties faced by the herdsmen and families in the cattle camps and the villages of Burkina Faso. He was there as a missionary doing ag work and doing ministry in the villages, but his language skills, he was able to determine when he was being abused or insulted. 
and quick enough to reply with a brilliant insulting comeback as he found out that this was the normal way to gain the respect of the local people, especially the town leaders. Paul was very quick with his intellect and his words, wasn't he? Paul's strength was proverbial and probably one of the reasons no one really picked on him in Africa. On our farm, we have the biggest strainer post in any fence on the entire farm that Paul dug the hole for with a crowbar and shovel and put a massive strainer in, rammed it in place without using a tractor in just one afternoon. Paul was always... That's Paul, isn't it? Yeah. As we mentioned before, Paul and Amt helped plant a lot of trees in the early days. But trees came, became more significant in Paul's story when a young couple, Tony and Liz Renato, heard Paul speak, or I think you were there too, were you, Anne? At Arvindale Uni, of the work in Burkina Faso, and eventually they ended up in Niger, a country just next to Burkina Faso. Tony and Liz were running a Christian school and trying to plant trees to help the people with their firewood and their everything that they needed over there was sort of dependent on trees food for their stock and everything else however nothing worked and tony prayed in desperation and god showed him the underground forest which is looking after the tree roots that are under the ground protecting them from livestock and pretty soon a new forest appeared now um that grew and developed right across africa uh, and there is a book called the underground forest is this christian book of the year from 2022 and there's been many uh, YouTube clips and many news reports of that. So in a sense, Paul and Anne were a part of God's process to get that to happen so that there are millions of hectares across sub-Sahara, across India, Timor and other countries that are now reforested because of Paul and Anne sharing their story in Armadale Uni. So God's plans are huge and sometimes we play a small part, sometimes it's a big part. So that's encouraging to know that just one word shared at a point in time had such a difference on our world, and that's Paul. Paul was interested in many subjects, as can be seen by his interest and influence in the Barrowville Museum, the local radio station as a DJ, the church in which we're meeting today, as well as the Missabody Road community and farming in that area and random locations where many of his friends live. But his prime passion would be to influence your life so you too may have a relationship with Jesus Christ as he did. Maybe you've heard Paul speak, always low key, always in the background, but maybe it's just a word here and there, saying a word that pointed towards God or encouraging you to look at a Bible verse or to consider following Jesus, the King of the universe. What effect did that have on you? We said earlier that Paul didn't leave fun at the door when he became a Christian. He didn't leave his intellect at the door either because, travelling back through time, I understand that he did the two-year Hawkesby Ag College in one and a half years, is that correct? <laughs> SMBC College was a two-year course. Well, you couldn't shorten that. He just added more to it. In Africa, he learnt languages rapidly he became very influential in the communities that he served. He came back to Australia and wrote a PhD on the something to do with appropriate aid to third world countries. Is that correct? Well, that's right out. Yeah, appropriate aid for people who are really struggling. Yeah, some Australians could use that at the moment. Um, and became a lecturer at the University of Western Sydney and headed up Baptist World Aid. So Paul had influence in many, many lives, in many, many situations. And uh, we respect Paul for that. It's been a great privilege to know him. So looking back over what we've seen, Paul was, had an influence, influential life and it was well lived. He was an inspiration to all who ever spent time with him. All because of Jesus who loved and cared for us. He is caring for Paul now. He, he cares and he's caring for you too. And for the rest of the family and for the rest of us.
The good news of Jesus tells that the God's love is so great that gave up, he gave up his son Jesus to fix the problem of death, of sin and of every other ailment that has beset our world. Please consider this and let this passage through Paul's life influence you as well. And Paul, we miss you so much. All of Jesus' followers are looking forward to meeting you again in heaven together with Jesus our Lord. And I'm sure there'll be lots more stories to share then. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. That was lovely hearing so many things about Paul's life. It makes me feel rather slack. Before we say the Lord's Prayer together, which is printed on the order of service, I'd just like to ask each one of us, to, in a moment of quiet, to bring before God those memories, the special memories each one of us have of Paul, giving God thanks for all that he has been and will continue to be in our lives. So we will be faithful in prayer, in silence, for just a minute. So as we collect all our prayers together, we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our next song is a setting of Psalm 23, The Lord's My Shepherd. Would you like to stand?
you like to sit down? Morning. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Kath, one of Paul's daughters. So me and Tim and Carolyn are just going to share a bit, as well as Nathan on behalf of the grandchildren. Um, after that, there'll be a, a slideshow of Dad's life. And then after that, we would invite any of you who have memories of Dad or have something that you would like to say. To There'll be a mic that comes around and you can have a chance to share. Um, Dad was born on the 28th of November 1950 um, at Crown Street's Women's Hospital in Sydney. He was then lovingly adopted by Stan and Dorothy Weekly and grew up in Pennant Hills with his older sister Elwyn and younger sister Gwen. When Dad was little, he, there's pictures around of Dad taking a hoe down the back, one of the backyards and digging hoes, digging holes and holes and holes, and that's what he loved to do as well as there's rumours and stories of many hours spent setting up intricate train tracks with his friends um, and playing trains. Dad also enjoyed time in his backyard and there's also an infamous, infamous cubby house that Dad built on the front gum tree of their house that he apparently built all by himself. So the practical skills came out early. Um, Dad went to primary school in Pennant Hills and then went to Epping Boys High. Um, one of the questions Dad often got from a young age is, where is your jumper? Dad didn't feel the cold and was often without a jumper, even in situations where the rest of us were rugged up a little bit more. Dad played soccer at school, even though his love was rugby, mm. because he wasn't allowed. But as soon as he was allowed, he left school and played union he was even attacked one day by the opposition player's mother after he did a big hit. So the mother attempted to hit him over the head with an umbrella because of his big hit. Um, after school, Dad um, went to Armadale and went to the Rural Science of University at New England. Um, th that summer, he had to complete a practical com component, which he did jackarooing at Bundamar Station, out, just out of Changi in western New South Wales. He then found out that he would have to repeat his year at uni, so he just decided to stay on at Bundamar. Um, he was not only mustering stock, but also worked on the irrigation there. His boss would have loved him to stay there working full time and working on different parts as well as the irrigation. But Dad's dad considered it to be a waste of time to start spend life out there in what, some ways. So he arranged to get credit to be done at UNE at Hawkesbury Ag College at Richmond. Dad then completed the three-year degree in two. During that time, Dad spent time wrestling and with committing himself to the hands of God and decided to submit to the saving grace provided in Jesus Christ and to follow God's plan for his life. As a consequence of that decision, of submitting his life into God's hands and seeing where God would lead him, um, in 1975, Dad began a two-year course at Sydney Missionary and Bible College, which is where he met Mum. They were engaged on June 12, 1976, and married on the 27th of November, 1976, um, which is actually the day before his birthday, so it's a good plan to remember his wedding anniversary. <laughs> Mum and Dad were then accepted to SIM, an interna international interdenominational mission agency, the day before their wedding. They then spent the following year with Dad pastoring the Baptist Church at Villawood in Sydney. Um, Tim was born in night March 78, and then Mum and Dad left Australia to study France in Albertville for um, 10 months. After that time in France, they arrived in Burkina Faso with two little kids, so Tim was 20 month, months and I was six weeks old. Um, I'm Tim, the eldest child of Paul and Anne. Um, <coughs> when we arrived in the town of Jibo in Burkina Faso, we, uh, Mum and Dad set up in a house on the hospital compound of an, another Australian, Ken Elliott. Um, 
it was a pretty simple house with a pit toilet out the back and a bit of an enclosed courtyard and there uh, dad started to learn the local language something that he, he as we've heard before he picked up pretty quickly and myself as a child picked up as well so we we had something in common there we as a family enjoyed two years living there and then moved further out of town to a little bush village to uh, look after a house while um, our own house was being built, including making our own Besser bricks to build said house. Um, <laughs> during that stage, uh, Carolyn, our, the youngest, was born in Ivory Coast in a, a small mission hospital there. But as someone with an ag love for ag, um, Dad's concern was with the people's ability to survive the droughts and famines that um, came through on a regular basis. They only had about one in every five years of decent r rain or sometimes any rain and the area was so deforested that the um, topsoil got blown away pretty quickly. And a quote from Dad, being from an ag background I worked with the nomads to help alleviate the chronic food insecurity. As well as famine relief, I provided support for locals setting up sustainable lakeside gardens in several communities and also facilitated the formation of a cooperative with the people involved. These cooperatives still go on today, even though we left in 1992. Um, these gardens taught the locals how to grow different fruit and veg vegetables that they didn't normally have in their diet because um, they mostly eat millet and form it into a porridge style. So with these uh, cooperatives they then had something to feed their families and so dad was kind of like a, a local hero because um, the community realised he had changed the lives significantly of, of a lot of them and allowed them to survive. It, Dad was always a very practical person. I remember once we were driving from Wagadugu, the capital, which was 200 kilometres to the south, and the road was um, basically a track in parts. Um, Dad used to carry a fair few spare parts, but he had only managed to get one radiator hose and lo and behold, the one he didn't have burst. So he grabbed the, um, a uh, lit a fire on the side of the road and found a tin can and boiled some water and grabbed the other hose that he did have and managed to soften it enough that we could bend it into a shape that would fit the other side and on we continued and finished the journey. <coughs> the Locals used to give him a couple of nicknames. That uh, the translation doesn't go exactly, but they called him Strong Bar of Iron. <laughs> and um, in fact, Mum was saying the other day that they were concerned that he shouldn't smack their son because it might kill him. Cause <laughs> 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 Never fear, it didn't stop him. <laughs> um, he also was called the hare. Um, I don't know if you know the story of Br'er Rabbit, but that comes from African folk stories where the hare was the cunning and witty animal that outsmarted all the others. Um, the Dad was considered to be a man of much strength as well as a smart person who could hold his ground in the cle with cleverness in interactions with them and was held in extremely high regard in the local village, especially by, by the uh, government authorities and the, and the local police chief who ended up being quite a good mate with Dad. <coughs> On another trip south to the capital, we, uh, we only had a single cab ute, none of the safety features. Don't, we didn't have seats, us kids, let alone seat belts. <laughs> um, we had a cage in the back to hold on to and a, and a bit of a bit of a mattress and bounced out. Lucky we weren't older or our teeth would have bounced out. <laughs> um, 
anyway, I decided to relieve the boredom in the back by getting my sisters to to join in on a prank where we'd we'd make a hissing noise and as soon as you were running out of breath you'd signal the next kid and then they'd start the hissing noise hoping he'd think he was had a had a puncture. <laughs> this went on for quite a while and he hadn't stopped yet and we thought, oh, we've wasted our time. And all of a sudden he stopped but um, he only checked one tyre before we all burst out laughing <laughs> because we couldn't keep a straight face. <laughs> anyway, I'll pass on to Kath again and she'll finish it off. Um, we as a family returned to Australia in middle of 92 and settled in Springwood in the Blue Mountains, which was near Dad's parents and his sister Gwen. Um, Dad had begun a master's degree at the University of Western Sydney in 1990, so he continued that, and he also lectured part-time at Hawkesbury. His supervisor then considered that the research he was doing for his master's degree was too good, and so they applied to transfer it to a PhD. So not bad, Dad, going from a diploma to a PhD and skipping all the steps in between. <laughs> um, he continued to lecture at UWS Hawkesbury, filling in his spare time with bushwalking, sometimes with us, sometimes by himself. Dad also spent many, many hours volunteering with the SES and later on up here with the Bush Fire Brigade. Um, Dad, though, spent many years with the SES, fixed many hours out fixing roofs after hailstorms. Um, a significant part of his SES experience, though, was being in Threadbow just after the landslide and um, being there and dealing with the impact of what he saw had a huge effort on him as his team recovered bodies and, and removed rubble from the Threadbow landslide. Dad's job at UWS was on a casual basis and so he began looking for something more secure. So he then moved to um, Baptist World Aid at Forestville which at that point involved a two and a quarter hour commute each way. So in the end, as us kids had all moved out of home and mum's work changed down to Blacktown, um, mum and dad moved to Parramatta. Um, they had an apartment on the edge of Parramatta Park in Westmead, which cut dad's commute. And dad also then enjoyed picking up cycling and cycling around the park and cycling many hours. Dad's work there involved frequent travelling overseas, evaluating and monitoring projects in many parts of the world, mainly Bangladesh, India, Vanuatu and Uganda. Another significant part of Dad's, that affected Dad greatly is what he saw after the Aceh Boxing Day tsunami in 2004, visiting there and helping people, but also seeing the impact of what that tsunami had on many, many people. From then, um, from 2004 on, Dad's life was enhanced again by many, by the grandchildren. So jo Isaac and Josh were born in 2004, Anna in 2005, Jack in 2007, Harry in 2008, and then Max and Nathan in 2009. It was amazing how many people we could fit into a two-bedroom flat in West Maine. <laughs> Well, Dad, I'm sure Dad and all of us were very thankful the park was just across the road. <laughs> um, but Dad definitely loved spoiling them. And they were all treated to many baby chinos and special treats. We're just going to hear a little bit from, the grand, from what the grandchildren want to say about their grandfather from Nathan. Paul, Dad, brother, friend, cousin and most special to me, Grandpa. I would like to start off by saying thank you, Grandpa. Thank you for volunteering at the radio station, the museum, and so many more. Grandpa was such a strong and loving and funny person. He always had dad jokes up his sleeves. I would also like to say thank you on behalf of Anne, Grandma, family and friends for joining us today to celebrate the momentous life Paul lived. I wanted to say some favorite parts of Grandpa that my cousins, his grandchildren, had to say. Harry, I always enjoyed going fishing with Grandpa. Isaac, I always loved Grandpa's dad jokes. Anna, I always loved how Grandpa called me Anadora Duck, and me calling him Jeepa, and also watching footy with him, and that I know I'll forever be his favorite granddaughter, and he'll be my fave Jeepa. Max, my favorite memory of Grandpa is when he called me Marshmallow. 
Jack, my favorite memory is tractor rides with Grandpa. And Josh, mine is when he got the Wallabies player to sign my Lightning McQueen hat, or when he made a billy car, and I crashed it halfway down the hill. I only lived 14 years with Grandpa, but I can assure you know it was the best years of my life. I remember going to the radio station with Grandpa, and I would always want to play Dancing Queen by ABBA. I would also like to close this speech in saying, missing you already, Grandpa. Make sure you have a good rest up in heaven, maybe a bit of wine too. Love you, Grandpa. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Carolyn, I'm the youngest of Dad's children, and I'm just going to read what Josh has sent me, his second grandchild. He can't make it today, he's overseas. Yeah. It's hard to say goodbye to someone who's been there for your whole life. Some of the best things I've had were visiting Grandma and Grandpa with the cousins. Grandpa always made it fun for us by going on an adventure, adventure walks at the farm, letting us ride the tractor. He took us to the beach or taking us fishing. Also, he would let us have, us have his sparkling water, also known as Grandpa Water. A couple of the best memories I have with Grandpa are the time when we were in Sydney and I had this Lightning McQueen hat. Grandpa spotted two Wallabies players and got their signatures on the hat. I still have that hat in my room today. Or the time at the farm when Grandpa built a billy car and he let me try it first. And he tried to teach me how to steer and brake with it, but of course I didn't manage to listen to that information. <laughs> I chucked on the helmet and went full speed down the bumpy hill. No brakes. I hit a divot in the ground and crashed 20 seconds later and then no one got to ride the billy cart. <laughs> one good thing is that we did get to say goodbye just before I left to Holland when we met and had lunch and had a great day fishing and eating hot chips in McLean. I know myself and everyone in the family and his friends will miss him very much. Until we meet again, goodbye, Grandpa. Dad's circumstances changed in May 2010, and Dad and Mum needed a change in the pace of life, so which has brought them up to this Nambaka Valley. Um, they bought a rundown farm in Missabody in early 2012. Between the moves, they enjoyed a couple of months travelling around France in a camper van, which is a holiday they both thoroughly enjoyed. The grandchildren continued to play a large part in Dad's life and enjoyed regular visits to the farm, where many happy memories were made as they played in mud and water and had many cowpat fights. <laughs> um, Dad and Mum attended the Anglican Church in Barrowville and progressively became more involved. Dad's ability to apply for grants, which has been honed at the, in his Baptist World Aid days, were put to good use um, in applying for grants. He also worked two days a week at the Barrowville Folk Museum, where he, is, he was currently president. Dad enjoyed helping families there reconnect with their links to the Nambaka Valley and connecting some of their family links. Dad also enjoyed his Monday afternoons on his one-hour radio program at 2NVR. The Weekly Fix, as Dad's radio was called, had a world music dimensions from all the different parts of his life coming together. So he, Dad played a lot of South and West African music, as well as a bit of French, and a mix from the 70s and 80s. The time then came for Mum and Dad to sell up at Missabody, and Dad and Mum moved to Valor Beach, where Dad quickly joined in the social events and meeting with a group of men on Tuesday afternoon, which him and Gus thoroughly enjoyed. Gus was always very keen to remind Dad that it was Tuesday afternoon and they needed to go. Um, Dad was, as you've heard, was involved here as a rector's warden and a part of the parish council. Dad kept fit walking and doing many different things. He enjoyed his fishing as well. He would so often walk into Nambucca Heads to meet up with Mum rather than take two cars. He, him and Gus often enjoyed their beach walks um, around and on the foil drive 
track just around them. In 2000, mum, dad and mum also bought a pop-top pop -top caravan and were exploring Australia, at least when COVID allowed. Um, and, but they most, so they mostly explored New South Wales, enjoying many quiet spots, streams, um, just to sit and be and fish. Um, and they had actually just returned from two weeks in Victoria um, on the Sunday before Dad passed. As you can see, Dad's life spanned from here in the Nambucca Valley all the way to pretty much Timbuktu. He's actually been to Timbuktu. Um, Jibo is not that far, where we lived in Burkina, is not that far from Timbuktu. Dad, in his laid back, practical way, loved people. We knew we were loved. Dad treated everyone the same. It didn't matter who you were or why you were interacting with him. Dad saw you as a person and treated you 100% the same way. Dad also loved his photography, loved getting behind the lens, and it was actually a struggle to find some photos of him because he was the one behind the camera. Getting that shot and seeing what God had created through his camera. Dad was a great dad to me and us, patiently loving us no matter what we we're up to. Um, and I'm thankful to Dad who followed his Saviour Jesus faithfully through all the ups and downs of life. And you're always there for me in your quiet words and loving support. It seems far too soon. And what I would do for one more conversation or one more hug. But I'm thankful for the hope we have. And that I will see you in heaven, Dad, one day. And even though it's fast too soon, enjoy sitting at Jesus' feet and being free from the worries of this world until then. You're a quiet achiever who always saw the best in people. You were laid back, you were kind, patient, loyal, and you always went for the underdog. I always remember looking up to you from a very young age. I would follow you around the yard in Jibbo, probably asking you a million questions while you were trying to work. But you always kept an eye on me and made sure I was okay. I loved hanging around you and being the youngest, I felt like I was daddy's little girl. And they'd probably agree I did get spoiled. <laughs> Your love of walking in bushwalks has been passed on to me and my husband and children Thank you a lot for that. <laughs> Dad, you never said a lot, but you could always tell how proud you were or how excited you were to be somewhere by your facial expressions. You were so proud of your grandchildren, each and every one of them. When Josh was born and we lived with you for the first few months of his life, you would get up in the middle of the night and take him while he was crying so I could get some sleep, even though you had to work the next day. But that's the, just the type of person you were. The kids came down and loved spending a week every school holidays with you and mum. This created such a special bond between you and the grandkids. You made up nicknames for the kids, which made them feel special and you always told your grandpa jokes. As the kids got older, you came to visit often and would watch all their soccer games when you could. I'm sure you would talk to anyone about how good your grandchild was. I'll never forget how proud you were when you came to my police graduation in Goulburn. You couldn't wipe the smile off your face and the hug I got was a big one. 
It made me feel special to make you proud. And all the effort to get to that point was worth it. I'm going to miss you, Dad. I love you. As the eldest dad and someone that looks like you, probably sounds like you, and <laughs> I know I have a lot of your mannerisms. <coughs> we share a love of rugby and all things practical. <coughs> I have so many um, precious memories, even if they were doing unpleasant things. I just enjoyed the time with you. I remember handing out um, emergency food aid during a famine out the front um, with you for hours, collecting trees by the thousand from the nursery to go and plant. I don't think I actually enjoyed that all the time. <laughs> I don't think I had a choice in being there. <laughs> helping him weld up people's carts and stuff off their farms and, and, and that. I actually en enjoyed that bit. There were, <laughs> um, I fondly remember hiking and camping with Dad and listening to his stories around the campfire. He was such a great storyteller. Just last year, um, uh, we organised an overnight hike down near Canberra and we, we uh, camped next to the um, alpine hut because you're not supposed to camp in them and but we lit a fire inside and sat in there and and chatted away and when we went to go to sleep all the dingoes started howling from across the valley so I don't think we got much sleep but we had we had a great time and uh, we were actually uh, in the planning stages of doing something like that again and unfortunately dad got snatched away. I'll miss your company, the, um, your knowledge. Um, I used to enjoy just sitting there sponging up um, what he knew, which is crap load more than me. <laughs> Most of all, I'll miss your love, your compassion and your selflessness. In fact, you'd probably be a bit embarrassed that we're so upset, but <laughs> it's because we love you. Till we meet again, Dad. So where do we go from now? I found a poem that somebody gave us when we were leaving Burkina written by Amy Carmichael, who at the end of the 19th century was a missionary in India. It's called, I Will Open Up the Way. Child of my love, fear not the unknown morrow. Dread not the new demand life makes of thee. Thy ignorance doth hold no cause for sorrow, since what thou knowest not is known to me. Thou canst not see today the hidden meaning of my commands, but thou the light shall gain. Walk on in faith upon my promise leaning, and as thou goest, all shall be made plain. One step thou seest, then go forward boldly. One step is far enough for faith to see. Take that, and thy next duty shall be told thee, for step by step thy Lord is leading thee. Stand not in fear thy adversaries counting, dare every peril save to disobey. Thou shalt march on, all obstacles surmounting, for I the strong 
will open up the way. Wherefore, go gladly to the task assigned thee, having my promise, needing nothing more than just to know where'er the future find thee, in all thy journeyings I go before. Faith smiles from a deep, deep place Starts in the heart, shapes the face He deals with me according to his mercy I'll be home in a little while Faith smiles Faith smiles Like a joyful child Safe, loved, undefiled Wisdom knows the weight of pain and sadness And heaven is its happy aftermath Faith loves Faith loves At the mess of sin Real tears For the world we're in Mercy leaves them Overcome with wonder Moved by love so tender Yet so deep Faith weeps Faith weeps Faith became a story Her life was not her own Jesus got the glory Jesus called her home She lived in grace She ran the race That's faith With a love divine Shines bright In the darkest time They sang around her bed As she lay dying Believing she'd be welcomed By her king Faith. 
faith and loves. Faith and loves. Faith loves. Faith weeps at the mess of sin. Real tears for the world we're in. Mercy leaves them overcome with wonder. Moved by love so tender yet so deep, faith weeps. Faith weeps. When faith became a story. Life was not her own. Jesus got the glory. Jesus called her home. She lived in grace. She ran the race. That's faith. Real. With a love divine, shines bright in the darkest time. They sang around her bed as she lay dying, believing she'd be welcomed by her king. Faith sings. on the order of service which is called personal remembrances as you can see this microphone is fairly uh, sensitive don't get it too close but if there's anybody who would like to share a remembrance we'll start with Alan my wife my wife Chris and I have only known Paul for a, a very short time about 10 years but we are very grateful and feel privileged to have been able to know and befriend him. And I am especially thankful for the occasions that I have assisted him here in this church. I'm certain that as we speak, Paul is residing in God's house now. So having been a faithful disciple yourself, Paul, rest in peace in God's loving care. My name's Clive and I first met Paul and Anne at the Sydney Missionary and Bible College at Croydon in the mid-70s. At that stage, um, Paul was a year ahead of me and he was head student uh, at the uh, Sydney Missionary and sometimes they call it the Sydney Missionary and Bridal College because that's where Paul met Anne, where I met my wife Jenny and where Phil, our speaker earlier, met his wife. Um, Paul has been mentioned, uh, and I thank you so much, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of you, for the sharing you did with so much courage. Uh, yeah, children of Paul and Anne, and, and uh, it, it was so touching to hear. A definition of greatness is when the people who are closest to you regard you highly and the remembrances have been quite touching to us all. Now, Paul and Anne, I want to just speak on behalf of the past students of the Croydon Bible College. Some are here today uh, passing on our, our special um, feelings for the weekly family. There are some who would have liked to come. Um, yeah, David Tickle, especially, and Paul Marjoram. 
Um, and it's good to have Lucy here. We appreciated Paul's leadership as head student there. Secondly, not only pass on special thanks there, but uh, I don't know if, if you're of a Falami uh, group in Africa and you understand English and you're seeing this, I know you give thanks so much to uh, Paul for his, as we heard earlier, his self-serving ministry to you in Africa. I was talking to uh, a fellow called Tony Ricardo from World Vision who a few um, weeks ago, a few months ago, and he spoke very highly of Paul and Anne and their ministry there. In, and so I, I speak on behalf of the Falami people too. Gratitude to God for Paul's ministry with Anne in Africa for so long. Um, I think we also heard that Dad loved people and that came out. It wasn't, you see, it was God's love working through Paul that enabled him to love the unlovely, especially when, uh, when sometimes when you're working in a third world country, they see us as filthy rich and what they can get out of us. But Paul and Anne served there, and I speak on behalf because I know, as one who worked in third world countries, how much. And for Paul and Anne's service there on behalf of Croydon Bible College students and the Falamis, we thank God for Paul's ministry and life. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Newman. I first met Paul oops, 10 years ago. We commenced our To NVR presenter training together. I, when I first met Paul, I thought, here is a man that holds great joy in his life. And a lot of people have mentioned how unassuming Paul was. I never heard him loud mouthing himself ever or saying an unkind word about anyone ever. It was often by accident that I discovered some of the many things that Paul was involved in since he moved here to the Nambucca Valley. And I'd love to thank his family for their eulogies today, where we learned so much more about the two depth of this amazing man. So thank you for sharing that with us. You will be remembered, Paul Weekly. My name's Alan, and I'm the uh, train playing child mate of, um, of Paul. Um, I first met Paul in, um, I was in fifth class, and he was in fourth class at Pennant Hills Primary School. And uh, the Weeklies lived on Victoria Road in Pennant Hills, and um, we lived on Loftus Road, but our backyards met, and so we played across backyards. And um, uh, the Weeklies had a pool, we had a tennis court. And uh, uh, with the Sindels and Graham's here today, uh, that was across two backyards. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a, an idyllic um, time of uh, a youthful um, endeavour. Uh, but Paul and I spent many hours and years playing trades. I had a Series 4 trying Hornby set, Paul had a series three trying Hornby set, and we worked out ways that we could actually marry the two sets together and run this quite uh, extensive uh, train set uh, in Paul's uh, lounge room, I think it was. Um, we also built um, an overhead um, wiring system so we could actually run these trains with the power coming through the overhead wiring. So maybe Paul and uh, I have uh, learned some engineering skills right back there which have been useful in life. So uh, 
but it was good fun and um, whilst uh, over the years uh, we uh, have gone in different ways when we always met up those memories were solid and the friendship was always there we also attended Pennant Hills Baptist Church together and we were in the youth group together we played soccer together I was left fullback and Paul was the right fullback and we didn't seem to go much beyond being fullbacks. Um, I'm glad he went on to play rugby though, because I think he was more a rugby man than a soccer man. Um, in the church, uh, the model of the evening service was that um, there was always an altar call. And for some years in Paul's teenage years, um, he actually went forward I almost lost count. I think it was probably four or five, maybe a dozen, maybe up, I don't know, maybe six or eight, who knows. Um, he wanted to get right with God as a teenager. And um, uh, I think the evidence of his life um, is certainly such that he was right with God. I mean, the uh, ability to stick at what they did, Anne and Paul, uh, in Burkina Faso, I think, is extraordinary. Uh, but not only that, uh, he's kept going. And he's left legacies in many, many places. And he's ended well. Sure, he's ended before his time. And we are deeply sad about that. And I wished I'd known more of him in the, uh, over the years, because as our paths uh, didn't always intersect. But it's just lovely to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, my condolences to Anne. Um, to um, Tim, to uh, Carolyn and Catherine and the grandchildren. Uh, he's sorely missed and uh, may he rest with his Lord. Amen. So my name's Claire. Uh, I also met Paul at the training at 2NVR 10 years ago. And for a couple of years, we um, presented one after the other. And so I was privileged to have that handover and the smiles and his love of music. And to echo what a lot of people have said, he, for me, with the authenticity of joy, he, the word Christian gets bandied around a lot and it doesn't always have a positive um, connotation. But for me, Paul, truly emanated what it was to be Christ-like. He, as his daughter said, treated everyone equally and um, regardless of how he knew you or what you were talking about, he shared so fully and generously. And I want to um, thank both him and Anne for coming back to this valley so that we could have the privilege of um, sharing some time together and some smiles together and some music together and some laughter together and um, I for one will truly miss his voice, his spirit, his presence and um, I want to play my respect, deep respect to his family and the sharing that they gave today so that we could know Paul even deeper than we did and I think Paul's son is a real chip off the old block um, and you know it, it's beautiful to see him living on so visually as well as with his, his daughters and his, his, his grandchildren. Uh, yes, thank you for sharing today and it's an honour to have known him. Thank you. I, I'm Brian Paid. Anne and I met Paul Ann I think first when they first came to the valley and they started worshipping in the Anglican church here. But Paul's a guy that'd have a jibe at you and have a real go, and if you didn't give it back to him, you wouldn't get any more out of him. He was really on, on the case all the time. He was built like a, a brick, strong as an ox, and uh, he used to drop into our shed, or my shed at times, when we, Ann and I moved to Maxwell, and he was a great help there when I was setting up the shed. But something that stood out to me in recent times, <coughs> when Paul and Ann lived up at Misabody, there was a bit of a problem with the river up there and there were letters going to the paper about it and things like that. And one particular fellow signed off as Dr. Somebody. Uh, not, not in that, I won't say the name. <coughs> anyway, later on, Paul replied, he responded, and the paper printed his letter, thank goodness. 
and he sorted the facts out, true and accurate, in Paul's style. But he signed off as Dr. Paul Wheatley, and that's when I first realised that he was such a bright, he was an intelligent guy, and he, he knew what he was talking about, and that guy didn't respond to his letter, by the way. <laughs> but by, by heck, I'll, I'll miss him, though. I worked with Paul at uh, Baptist World Aid Australia, where he was the programs director, and I was recruited to look after Pacific projects. But we hit it off because, like him, my family had lived overseas for a dozen years, and also I, we had worked in West Africa. So we became good friends, which continued after we both left PWAA. The, and the significant thing about him was uh, his integrity, not only in his personal behaviour, but in his thinking, and his honesty and in his choices and decision making. But I remember a story told, I wasn't there, where he'd visited West Africa, and as people do, they take you round to the projects that they're running. And this included a visit to a chook house. So he go, he, Paul went into this chook house, so he tells the story, and he's listening to these chooks, and he thinks, this is a very quiet chook house. These hens are just sitting in here, murmuring away and clucking. Then he looked out of the window and noticed that the garden from which they fed these chooks included a large number of marijuana plants. <laughs> so, so the, you know, the young bloke who was looking after this, this uh, chook enterprise was regaling everybody with the story of uh, you know, how he developed it. And then he finished and Paul sidled up to him and looked him in the eye and said, uh, do you feed those green leaves to the chooks? And Paul said, I could see the fear and anxiety in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this is Baptist World Aid Australia. <laughs> and then he said, the young bloke saw the glint in my eyes and he broke into an enormous smile. <laughs> so that was the realism of Paul, side his integrity, the other side of him was that he understood the practicality of life from his experiences in Australia and, and in Burkina Faso and in other parts of the world and, and shows you how well he treated people and uh, how understanding he was of different situations. Anybody else want to, uh, Clyde? You can go up there. You know your way round. <laughs> so we are here today to celebrate. We're celebrating that today we can be assured that Paul is in heaven with his Lord and Saviour. We're also celebrating his life and what an amazing life of service to his Lord that we've heard about today. There was so much more than I knew. I was the rector here when um, we were joining together the parish of Nambucca Heads and Maxville. And it was quite a big undertaking. Uh, it um, was something that I think uh, a lot of, lot of people just uh, can't really appreciate just how much is involved in bringing together two parishes because it involves so much in terms of relationships and love and um, all those Christian values that we hold so dear. And wasn't that just an amazing Bible passage that Anne read to us today at the beginning? It was just Paul to a T. And Paul was just such a tower of strength, a tower of support, when we were trying to bring together these two parishes, or more to the point, the three worship centres of Barrowville, Nambucca Heads and Maxwell. And he was that because he exemplified just so well service to his Lord in all of those things that we've heard today, in all of those words that we've heard from the Bible and that we read in the Bible. He truly knew what it was all about to, uh, to uh, have a God, to worship a God of unity, a God of relationship, 
And that, that was all just so much a part of what we had to do here, that we had to bring together the parishes in unity. We had to bring together the people in relationship. And Paul was able to do all that because it, it, was, it was him. It was part of his heart. He just naturally did all the things and accepted the whole concept of what was necessary for that to happen here. So I just wanted to, for people to know that as well as all of those amazing things that Paul has had in his life, through the mission field, through his involvement with assisted denomination, but also the amazing work that he had, that he achieved here in this parish of Nambucca Valley in helping to set it up. We owe so much to Paul. He will be so greatly missed within this parish of Nambucca Valley. Of course, we acknowledge also the grief and the loss that Anne and Paul's children and grandchildren will be experiencing as well. But we know that we can rejoice through having known Paul, even though for some of us only a short period of time, he just touched so many hearts and he just uh, has left such an amazing example for all of us to dwell on, to think about and to see if we can emulate. It's a challenge and certainly I challenge the people of the parish of Nambucca Valley to carry forward what Paul demonstrated for you folk in terms of understanding what it's all about to have that God of unity and relationship and joining together, coming together and being part of the greater whole of the Christian family of God. Thank you. A representative from SIM, the Mission Society we went out with, was not able to be here today, but they, their national director, Malcolm Watts, has sent this. We were saddened to hear of Paul's sudden passing recently and wish you our sincere condolences during this time. The death of someone who has served with us not only points us to reflections of their ministry, location and family, but equally to the fact that the promise of the gospel that has been taken to the nations through them is now experienced in full by the one we have lost. The mission family of SIM gives thanks to God for his faithful servant and our fellow labourer Paul. He is now remembered as another key part of God's global mission story. Thank you, Anne and family, for serving together with Paul in making Christ known. Our prayers, thoughts and thanks go to you. We trust our Lord for his care of you all until that day when you meet him and are reunited with Paul. From now on, Anne will be known as Anne Two Hugs Weekly. <laughs> as Clyde has just said, um, I took over from Clyde and I've benefited hugely from all the work that was done bringing the two parishes together. Parish Council meets on Thursday morning and we will continue that work. I'll just say a couple of prayers and then we will sing our final song this, this morning. And then there are refreshments at the back. Please, that was, it's lovely, it's an absolute joy to see so many people here and to have heard so much about Paul's life. Um, feel free to sit anywhere in church once you've got your food. Don't worry about the mess, we've got cleaners that are coming in later in the week, it's fine. <laughs> right, a more formal prayer to finish us off. 
Paul, go forth on your journey from this world in the love of God the Father who created you, in the mercy of Jesus the Redeemer who suffered for you, in the power of the Holy Spirit who keeps you in life eternal. May the angels of God receive you and the saints of God welcome you. May your rest this day be in peace and your dwelling the paradise of God. Paul, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Would you like to stand for the blessing? And then we'll sing our socks off with how great thou art. And now may the blessing of the God of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you, giving you life, bearing your pain, making you whole. May God bring you through the narrow gate and across the great river. And may God reconcile us all in joy, both living and departed, in the merriment of heaven. Amen. And our final song this morning, How Great Thou Art. Oh Lord my God, where I am also
what a fabulous funeral service. For those of you at NVR, please play Under African Skies. I won't be able to hear that without thinking about Paul. And I'll never read that passage from Romans chapter 12 without thinking about Paul as well. Food is about to be served. I'll just say grace so you can all tuck in with a good conscience. Loving God, thank you for all of your wonderful gifts. We thank you for the gift that Paul has been and will continue to be for each one of us. We thank you for the food we're about to share, for those who've grown it, those who've delivered it, those who have prepared it. And may we never forget those who will go without this day. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.